Towards a New Socialism. Section. Diane Elson, The Socialized Market. Diane Elson, 1988, has argued that a socialized market provides a third alternative between planning and the free market. We believe that her proposal for a socialized market concedes far too much to bourgeois economics. It appears to involve an uncritical acceptance of Alec Nove's claim that efficient central planning is impossible a claim we have been at pains to rebut in previous chapters. Specifically, we argue, one, that by shifting her attention from the production to the exchange process, Elson effaces the main point of the Marxist critique of capitalism, and two, that her socialized market system would retain most of the social and production relations of capitalism, and would be more accurately described as state capitalism rather than socialism. And three, that it would be susceptible to all the characteristic instabilities of capitalism. A large part of Elson's article is devoted to showing that real capitalist markets are far removed from the ideal markets assumed by most advocates of market socialism. She argues that they involve real costs in terms of resources to function, that they are rarely freely competitive, that consumer sovereignty is not really effective, that Say's law does not operate, etc. She makes reference to an extensive recent literature to reinforce her point. This sort of criticism though it is of value in pointing out the lack of realism in the formulations of the outright pro-marketeers, seems to fill in for an absent concept. The concept of exploitation is missing from the critiques of capitalist markets to which she refers. Socialism as a political movement did not arise because consumers were dissatisfied with the way the market was organized. It arose because capitalism is an exploitative system whose victims sought redress. Capitalism allows the wealthy to exploit the labor of the poor. Socialism was the response to the exploitation of wage labors by capitalists. We have made reference to the classical Marxist conception of exploitation throughout this book. In the present context, the important point is that one of Marx's, Marx's central concerns was to refute the idea that exploitation arises from imperfections in the operation of the market. Instead, he argued, it arose from the very logic of commodity production. In order to demonstrate this theoretically, he made the, quote, generous assumption that commodities exchange in proportion to their labor values. This was the ideal put forward by the most advanced bourgeois economist, David Ricardo. Marx was well aware that a whole series of complicating factors, different capital intensities, partial monopolies, and so on, would prevent prices in a real capitalist economy being proportional to labor values. He nonetheless assumes this proportionality in Volume 1 of Capital. He assumes that in every sale or purchase of a commodity, equivalents are exchanged. The currency is based on gold, and in each sale or purchase, the amount of labor embodied in the gold is equal to that in the commodity being purchased. In other words, he assumes no, assumes no cheating in the exchange process. He knew that this was all counterfactual that workers were routinely sold adulterated products, cheated through the truck system or extra deductions from their wages. But for the sake of argument, he says, let us grant that the market be completely fair. I will show that it still leads to the exploitation of the working class. The key to exploitation, Marx argued, was the special character of labor power. 
Labor power is unique in that its utility to a capitalist is its ability to create value. Labor power is assumed, like every other commodity, to sell for its cost of reproduction. But in many cases, of course, labor power will sell for less than its cost of reproduction. For instance, where, farmers are, where workers are part-time farmers and don't buy all their food on the market. But even if it does sell for its full cost of reproduction, exploitation still takes place. The working day is prolonged to produce absolute surplus value. Technology cheapens the means of subsistence and produces relative surplus value. The political point of this argument was to rebut those who argued that fair trading, the abolition of monopoly, and a just level of wages would bring the salvation of the proletariat. Marx argued to the contrary, that only the abolition of the wages system itself would end exploitation. No reform of the market could possibly remove the antagonisms at the heart of capitalism. But a reform of prices is just what Elson proposes. Elson proposes a variety of publicly funded institutions that would set price norms. These institutions would have available to them detailed information about the cost of production of different products. On the basis of cost plus some markup, they would set price norms for each commodity. It is not made clear what the basis of the markup would be. Would it be proportional to the capital employed or to the recurrent costs? The setting of these price norms, which are apparently not intended to be binding, together with the publication of the data on which they are based, is termed the socialization of the market. The term socialized market is rather misleading, since markets have always been social institutions. They are the typical way in which private individuals enter into social relations in the capitalist epoch. When the word social is combined with the word market, the social market economy, socialized market, market socialism, we should be on our guard. Given that exploitation would exist even under the very generous assumptions made by Marx, the socialized market would also allow it. The socialized price norms are to be merely indicative, not binding on buyers and sellers. Quote, price and wage commissions can generate price and wage norms and can supply the information to enable buyers and sellers to police prices and wages in a decentralized way. End of quote. From Elson, 1988, page 33. If the norms are not accepted by the market, then it is the norms, not the market prices, that are altered. <clears throat> the main difference between the socialized market and a normal one seems to be that in the former, the taxpayer subsidizes some costs of marketing that would normally be borne by bu the buyers and sellers. We can conclude that although this market might adjust more smoothly than an unsubsidized one, its effects would not be very different. If we look at the crucial issue of the buying and selling of labor power, Elson's proposal looks suspiciously like the sorts of prices and income policies that were used to regularize exploitation in the 1960s and 70s. The Wages and Price Commission is to produce norms for all wage rates. This is clearly not the abolishing the wages system. It is a means of regularizing it. The hierarchy of wage rates previously enforced by private economic contracts now becomes a matter of public policy to be legitimized by a state organ. At the same time, the Price and Wage Commission will doubtless be mindful of the need to ensure industrial profitability. Here we come onto contentious ground, 
since the setting of wage rates affects the rate of exploitation. Any attempt to set higher wage norms will be resisted by employers. Any attempt to set lower ones by the unions. If the wage norms are binding, actual wage rates will be determined by the relative strengths of employers and unions in the traditional way. Strikes, lockouts, etc. There is one measure that Elson proposes which could significantly alter the rate of exploitation. This is the idea that all citizens should be assured a basic minimum income, whether they are employed or not. This policy is advocated by the Greens, and under capitalist conditions, it is undoubtedly in the working class interest. If workers on strike know that their families will always be able to eat, their position is strengthened, and strikes will be more solid and successful. But we should not overestimate the impact of this sort of unconditional social security benefit. Diane Elson indicates that she views it as very much a bare subsistence minimum, enough to provide a diet of lentils, a few pairs of cheap jeans, and some coconut matting on the floor. It does not sound much better than living on contemporary social security benefits. It would be driven by the same contradictory factors as all social security schemes. It must keep people alive, but not undermine their incentive to work, nor impose a heavy tax burden. People often have other commitments that they have entered into whilst working. Mortgages, higher purchase, etc. Social security benefits can quickly be eaten up by these when people go on strike or become unemployed. Unconditional social security benefits are a worthwhile reform in a capitalist country. They would help reduce poverty and would aid the class struggle. What they will not do is, quote, remove the basic cause of antagonism between buyers and sellers of labor power, end of quote. The buying and selling of labor power is the prelude to exploitation and is inherently antagonistic. For the enterprises that purchase the labor power will still be jur juridical subjects whose objective is to use the labor power to make a profit. They will be legal personalities with the right to buy and sell and enter into contracts. In short, they will be what Marx termed personifications of capital. They might be owned by the state and have to pay interest to the state on capital advanced but that would no more remove their capitalist character than did state ownership of British Leyland. Indeed, Elson proposes an auditor called the Regulator, Regulator of Public Enterprises, whose function is to ensure that the state obtains an adequate rate of return on its capital. Where labor power continues to be bought and sold on the market, there is bound to be a struggle over its price. In a capitalist economy, unemployment is the ultimate regulator of wages. Under conditions of full employment, the economic class struggle leads to wage inflation. It may be possible to regulate this to some extent, by, extending price, by, ex extent by binding prices and income policies. But the purely voluntary mechanism which she describes is likely to be unstable. Either it will lead to inflation, with consequent pressure for a return to un unemployment to discipline the workforce, or there will be demands for mandatory price controls. Society will be faced with the alternative of capitalist or socialist paths of development. This is exactly the alternative that is posed with absolute clarity in countries like Poland or Hungary or Russia at the time of writing. 
1992. Either the economy reverts to the whip of unemployment, without which there can be no true labor market, or moves in a communist direction and establishes direct social regulation of production and income. This is not to deny that the sort of total state capitalism proposed by Elson would be progressive in a British context. One can see it as the asymptote towards which British social democracy tended in the pre-Thatcher period. Almost total nationalization, voluntary prices and incomes policies, comprehensive rights to social security benefits. As such, it would be far more in the working class interest than the present dispensation. But we know from experience that the state capitalist type of social order is unstable. It retains the money, markets, and bourgeois income differentials of capitalism, whilst removing the unemployment needed to make these effective and at the same time weakening the state as an element of bourgeois class discipline. It is a transitional form of society which must either revert to private capitalism, as in Britain, or go in a socialist re re direction. The same holds good in the converse direction. But the move away from a planned socialist economy towards a state capitalist or market socialist one, is unequivo unequivocally reactionary. The resulting form can only be an unstable one that will gravitate through class struggle into capitalism or else back towards communism. The irony is that Elson's socialized price-fixing agencies would have the computer networks and the information about production needed to make an effective transition towards planning. If she were advocating such agencies as a transitional measure leading up to a planned economy, they might be justifiable. But in the current world situation, where capitalism is on the offensive, transitions towards capitalism seem more likely. Proposals for a third way between capitalism and communism will be just transient staging posts on the journey to full capitalist restoration. All market economies are subject to macroeconomic instabilities. The two main forms that they take are recessions in which products cannot be sold, creating unemployment, or excess demand creating inflation. In those socialist countries that are reverting to the market, we see both of these, roaring inflation, combined with millions being thrown out of work. Elson, like any intelligent left-wing economist, is clearly aware of these propensities of market economies, but she offers no real solution. Whatever one might say against the economic system that used to operate in the USSR before Gorbachev, Prices were stable, and there were no recessions. The Soviet system was not without problems. Only the willfully blind could think that. But any changes to the socialist system as it had been known this century should be a step forward for the working people. What Elson and similar thinkers in Russia are advocating is a retreat from Marx towards the doctrines of Adam Smith. End of section.